All right, so verse 17. I'm so sorry. Okay, then. And behold, so uh, God says, lo and behold, so take a look. I, even I, so God's saying, I, yeah, that's me, right? That's the idea. Do bring a flood of waters upon the earth. He's going to bring a huge flood of waters all over the earth to destroy all flesh. He's going to wipe out all of mankind. Wherein is the breath of life? Every Everybody who has breath in them that's alive. From under heaven, everyone that's below heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. So everything that is in the earth, God says that he's going to make sure that they're wiped off the face of the earth and that they will be dead. If you look at verse 18, but with thee will I establish my covenant. However, on the other hand, God says, but with you, I'm going to make a promise, a covenant where you will be protected and uh, preserved the covenant let's keep reading and thou shalt come into the ark so Noah's going to come inside the ark thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons wives with thee so him his sons his own wife and his sons wives are going to accompany him into the ark so they are the ones that are going to be protected and God says uh, only through them will they be protected so, understanding that Noah's families are the only one who are going to survive this catastrophe, God says, that's why I'm going to establish, so he's going to make, set a standard of a covenant or a promise with them. Now, that's the first thing that you're going to, mention, uh, you're going to notice about covenant in the Bible. Now, in the Bible, there are known as eight or seven covenants, if I recall. But uh, Dr. Ruckman, he has a series which I would highly recommend, and it's called The Covenants. Now, The Covenants is very important if you want to uh, get down dispensationalism, okay? So that's very important. You need to know dispensationalism through the covenants rather than the dispensations, periods of time. You might say, why? Because the periods of time, they... Uh, sometimes have the covenants overlapping. Yeah. So that's why it's better to divide things by covenants rather than by time periods. So I would recommend to uh, listen to his audio recordings on that one. I also have a video online that you can look up yourself and covenant versus dispensation, dispensations, which one's more accurate. So I would recommend for you to listen to that one as well. Now, the covenants, obviously this is not the first one God made. He made one with Noah, and we're going to see that covenant at Genesis 9 later on. All right, Genesis 9 will explain what the covenant is. But there were other covenants before Noah, and you are obviously know some of them. The first one is at Genesis chapter 1 and where God told Adam and Eve where they are supposed to spread out throughout all the earth and that they were not supposed to eat the fruit from off the tree because eating the fruit less, the Bible says, or they're going to die. They will surely die. So that's the reason why they cannot uh, eat the fruit. But they broke that. So that was the Edenic covenant. The Edenic covenant. So I'm just going to write just a few of the covenants right here. But uh, the Edenic covenant was the one that was before Noah. And then the second one is Genesis chapter 3. And Genesis chapter 3 is where we see the Adamic covenant. The Adamic covenant is where God made a covenant with mankind and Adam that uh, the seed will come through Eve and that it will bruise the head of the serpent. The third covenant that we're going to see later on is Noahic, and that's Noah's covenant, where they were preserved, they survived, and they're supposed to spread out and fill all over the earth. So these following are known as the covenants. But again, I recommend to you listen to Dr. Upman's teaching on the covenants. You can find that easily in his bookstore, or you can go to our YouTube channel, and you can find uh, my video teaching about covenant versus dispensations. Now, let's keep reading on. We go back to Genesis chapter 6. 
Verse, eight, uh, verse 19, and of every living thing of all flesh. So God says every living thing uh, of all flesh. That's referring to the animals. We're going to find that out because of verse 20. So you can tell that that's the list of the animals. Within the list of animals, God says two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark. So God tells Noah that two of every sort is going to be brought inside the ark of all the animals. You notice that it's a sort, not species. You notice that? To keep them alive with these. So that way they can stay alive. That way they don't uh, die out, the animals. They shall be male and female. So obviously the two animals are going inside the ark. One's going to be male, the other one's going to be female. Now, you notice that your PhD educated university professors, they can't read uh, plain English. They think that they've uh, debunked Noah's Ark because how are you going to fit all the species inside Noah's Ark? Hey, you didn't read verse 19. It didn't say species, it said sort. They don't know how to read proper English there. It's sort. So, because it's sort, now look at verse 20. Of fowls after their kind. So the birds are also included. After their kind. See that? It's following the language of sort and kind, not species. And of cattle after their kind. So it's going to be uh, cattle as well, livestock after their kind, not species. Of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind. So any sort of animal that, or insect that crawls around the earth after his kind. Two of every sort, see that explains again, it's two of them, but it's sort, shall come unto thee to keep them alive. So they're going to come to uh, Noah, and Noah's going to make sure that they are preserved and they're going to be alive. So the evolutionists, you see that they're already debunked here, but then they ask this uh, ridiculous question, well, uh, that's what we have to resolve, you know. What does kind mean? You know, the Bible says kind, but what does kind mean? Kind of animals. So because we don't know what kind means, thus that means that the Bible is wrong. Well, that's a dumb, you notice that's a dumb argument? Because we don't know what kind means, thus we disprove Noah's Ark? No, you dummy, you have to prove what kind is in order to disprove Noah's Ark. What are they talking about, man? So, kind, they bring up this question to you, and then Christians feel like that they have to have the burden of proof to explain what kind is, otherwise Noah's Ark, it's disproven. No, you can't disprove something without evidence. So, you have to, they have to have the burden of proof that kind was referring to species. But obviously, in the Bible, it's debunked. It's not species, it's sort. Now, what does sort mean? It's pretty simple here. All right, so here are the following evidences that you want to keep in mind about kind. First of all, before we get into sort, you have to see this one. What is God looking at to preserve, uh, to make sure that the uh, animals, that the right number or kind, whatever that is, gets inside the ark? So what does that mean? Well, it's obviously enough where it's able to preserve the animal kingdom. That's the idea. So then, you don't need, uh, you don't need every, uh, every species of dogs. What you can do is just simply get uh, two dogs, no matter what kind of breed or whatever species or wherever you want to go at. You just have to get two, and then in time, which evolutionists have to admit because they argue this is how evolution is done, is that through process of time of constant intermingling and then through certain microevolution stages, then what do you get? What you get is all kinds uh, and all uh, species, excuse me, so I'm not going to use kind right here because the reason why I'm trying to go by scripture explaining what kind is, but the idea is you're going to get all sorts of species of dog. Yeah. That's the idea. But God, when he's thinking about kind, is just simply, he's looking not at the scientific classification system. Yeah. We're the ones that made that. All the way at the BCs, God didn't have that in mind. He was just thinking, I just want different kinds of animal. So what do you think he was thinking? Dog, cat, stuff like that. So that's what he's thinking. How do we know that kind is referring just enough to keep the population going because you didn't read the scripture just look at Genesis chapter 7 
It says here uh, that at verse 19, of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort, shalt thou bring into the ark to, notice, keep them alive with thee. Verse 20, of fowls after their kind, cattle, their kind. Notice the last part, to keep them alive. So it's to keep the animal population going. So it's, what is kind? Basically, what God sees, just enough for the animal kingdom. That's the idea. Just enough for the animal population to keep going. But another example is the word uh, sort itself. That's what kind is, sort. What do you think sort is? You're not looking at every single little detail of the differences. It's just a general difference or general kind. So, like the Bible says right here by context, he's seeing kind as what? Basically, verse 19, every living thing of all flesh, all kinds of animal. So, referring to all sort. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Notice that the Bible says flesh right here, right? You notice that? Flesh at Genesis 6. All right, understanding that it's referring to flesh, what does God see as different sorts of flesh? What does God see as different sorts of flesh? He's not naming 500... Uh, He's not naming all 500 or hundreds of different species of birds, land animals, reptiles, etc. He's not looking at that way. He's just looking at the animal itself different. Uh, he's looking that as a different sort. Because why? Flesh has all different sorts. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Notice that God is seeing as a general perspective. He's not seeing as every single uh, small detail of the science classification system and difference. He's just looking at a general perspective. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Notice what the Bible says at verse 39. All flesh is not the same flesh. Now remember Genesis 6? He's gonna just, uh, he wants Noah to bring all living flesh, right? What's all living flesh? So he mentioned his family, obviously. And then he mentioned the birds, and then he mentioned uh, the creeping thing and the land animals. Because just keep reading, verse 39, but there is what? One kind of flesh of what? Men. Another flesh of what? Beasts. Another of fishes and another of birds. Look at that. God's seeing just generally. He's not seeing as every single small species. There's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about that. So when God sees it as kind, let the scripture interpret itself at verse 39. So it's sort. And by the way, you can look up the word sort in your Bible and see if God is looking at a general perspective or if he's looking at every minute detail. So sort is one. The other one is look what the Bible says about kind itself, which is found at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let scripture, scripture interpret itself. But here's a strong, uh, the strongest evidence. The strongest evidence is what do you think God is looking at to make sure the population goes on and survives? So we see at 1 Corinthians 15, mankind is mentioned, beasts, birds are mentioned, right? Look how it, that kind of, that's God's classification system. He doesn't go by a bio, uh, biology or the scientist term of classification. He's going by how he views his classification system. Notice that matches with Genesis chapter 6 and then uh, verse 18. Notice humans, right? Notice verse 19. Uh, well, we'll skip down verse 20. The birds, the creeping things. Uh, verse 19, you can see your animals there. So that's God's classification system. Okay, think about it. Human is in the context here, right? At verse 18. Do you think God had every, quote-unquote, species of humans inside Noah's Ark? 
No, but, uh, you, but if evolutionists truly believe in evolution, they believe this throughout process of time. When you keep intermingling and environmental factors, things change and you can get your different species later on. I mean, I thought they believe in evolution. So why is it so hard to believe in Noah's Ark? God knew about the microevolution stages of uh, animals and humans changing. You don't think God knew about that? So God's not stupid, so he says, no, we got enough inside the ark. And I don't care what your evolution professors say. They don't even know evolution. That's how stupid they are. Amen. <laughs> so that's, so jokes on these guys. See, so these people who claim to know more science than you do, they don't know science at all. They try, they, you know what they are? They're just nitpicky to find anything wrong with your Bible. But the Bible's way ahead, you notice that. Amen. It's way ahead of the scientists. Just look how God preserved humankind. Then don't you think God knows how much to preserve animal kind? And he's not worried about, yeah, Noah's Ark can't fit all species of animal. Come on, man. All right, let's look at, uh, let's continue reading on at Genesis chapter 6. And then we re will read verse, let's see, 21 probably. 21. And take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten. So God tells Noah, make sure that you bring to yourself all, uh, all food that you can eat. And thou shalt gather it to thee. So make sure you gather it, store it for yourself. And it shall be food for thee and for them. So it's going to be food for uh, Noah. And it's going to be food for the animals as well. So notice that Noah was storing up food. Why? Because he's preparing for a catastrophe. And I think that's uh, pretty important for people to understand is that uh, you notice that Noah was preparing. Why? Because there's a catastrophe. So you notice here, if that's what God instructed and commanded Noah to do, then Bible-believing Christians shouldn't be... Uh, there are two things here. One, they shouldn't be worried or they don't have to think it's a sin if they store up food for themselves. See, so when the coronavirus incident happened, and then we had Y2K a long time ago, and etc., some Christians are wondering, am I uh, backslidden if I store up, prep up food? No, actually. That's something that the Lord will want you to do if there's a catastrophe that's coming your way. Amen. So there's nothing wrong with that. But there's a second thing that we can learn here about storing up food. The second thing that we can learn from here about food preparation is that Noah, he was going through the apocalypse right here, okay? So he was going through his apocalypse moment. Going through uh, his apocalypse moment, Noah had to prepare all, all food for himself to preserve it but guess what? Bible-believing Christians, we're not going through the main apocalypse. So because we're not going to go through the main apocalypse, that's the reason why we don't have to worry about storing up our guns, our food, our gold, and then fight out against the governor, uh, government and go through the tribulation. No, that apocalypse is reserved for the end times. So then in our case, we don't have to panic and worry about that either. A great example is this coronavirus time. During this coronavirus time, you might recall where I told you before about like we don't have to worry. The Lord's going to take care of us and he'll give us food. And then d when the coronavirus thing happened and California was shutting down, sure, uh, some of us were fearful. But guess what? People who prepared and stored up the food were also fearful as well. Didn't make a difference. And none of you died. No, not one of us died. We lived through it. The Lord took care of us. Why? Because the Lord gave us enough preparation time. He gave us enough mercy and grace. And He took care of us. So you notice here that's the idea is a balance. So the importance between the two is the balance. For food preparation, there's nothing wrong to be wise and to prepare things. But at the same time, it is wrong where you have to avoid extremism and feel like that this is truly the end and this is going to be the end of the world. We're all going to die. No, we're doing just fine. 
we're doing just fine. I know that things are bad, but guess what? We're not like the Christians back then who went through worse times than uh, us. Even the lost people during the days of World War II, the Great Depression and all that. The Lord's taking care of us, much better compared to back then. So the idea is this, is that there has to be a balance between Christians. As long as you put your faith in the Lord and then you use wisdom to make right decisions, then you will live. And the greatest example is now what we're going through, through the coronavirus times. That's how we've been living. That's how our church survived. That's how we're able to keep serving God. Because we're not stupid in not preparing anything, but at the same time, we're not being paranoid either and going overboard. Amen. So that's important to understand, and I hope that will be helpful to you. With this case, I hope you realize when you avoid extremism, Noah's case, like I told you before, his was the apocalypse. Because he was the apocalypse, Noah is the example of a tribulation saint surviving going through the apocalypse. Now notice that Genesis is repeating Revelation. So there are going to be Noah's in the end times, in the apocalypse that, yeah, you better store up your food because when the mark of the beast comes out, you can't buy or sell when you avoid the mark. You have to get your own food. You better get your guns. Why? Because God says that you're going to have to go to war and defend yourself against the Antichrist government. We don't do it now. We don't condone rebellion against the government right now. We believe that we have to be obedient to the powers that be. But if it crosses Christian doctrine, then that's where we have to say no. And then we have to lay down our life for Jesus Christ. Amen. But notice that our action and reaction is very different from a tribulation saying. Mm -hmm. Why? Because today where you hear the law about Christian laws and doctrine about submission to the powers that be, going through persecution, being a good testimony, uh, loving the enemies, uh, taking care of the enemies. That's very different from a tribulation saint who seeks vengeance against the enemies, defend his homeland as prophesied by the book of Zechariah, and that he has to uh, survive through the tribulation because they can't buy or sell due to the mark of the beast. So see, that proves dispensationalism. A tribulation is different from church age. Tribulation saying is different from a Christian in the church age. That's dispensationalism, and you're going to get all your doctrines sorted out. We're not, we're not Noah. If Genesis is repeating Revelation, then who are we? Remember? Did you remember? If you go back to Genesis 5, you remember, right? We're Enoch. We're Enoch. And Enoch, he goes through the wicked stages of the world that Noah went through. He did. But he just got raptured before the apocalypse happened. There is no doubt that studying this, Genesis is truly repeating Revelation. If you see a pattern of mankind and God's dealing in Genesis, well, then why don't you believe that's going to be the case today and in the future? So people who deny a rapture before the apocalypse, they don't, they're not familiar with God's ways of doing things because he did that back at Genesis as well. Didn't the Bible say at the book of Luke, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the coming of the Son of Man? See, what's going to happen in the tribulation in the future is going to repeat Noah's timetable at Genesis. You have to understand that. All right, returning to Genesis chapter 6 again. Genesis chapter 6, verse 22. Verse 22. Thus did Noah, so Noah did everything that God told him to do, food preparation, letting the animals in, building the ark. According to all that God commanded him, so did he. So everything that God commanded him to do, Noah did it. Is that said about you, I wonder? Notice that God repeated it again at verse 5. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. How about that? Look at verse 9. There, uh, chapter 7, verse 9. There went in two and two unto Noah and to the ark, the male and the female, as God had commanded Noah. So notice that Noah 
did everything that God commanded him to do and God repeated it several times. So, in order, we're going to kind of hear a little bit about that in today's preaching. All right? So, I'll explain a little bit more. So, it'll be good. It'll be good preaching. But, in this case, what I can explain is that what we have to understand, when God commands us to do something, you have to ask yourself, do you do everything that God told you to do? Now, in order for you to do what God told you to do, there are several things that you need to do. The first thing is, uh, let's look at James and then Romans 10. James and Romans 10. You want to be known as the person that God said, oh yeah, I trust that person. He's going to do everything that I uh, want him to do. You want to be that person. You know what the devil said to God? Uh, Lord, Job will curse you to your face. And God's like, no, I know Job. He's going to do everything that I want him to do. Wow, amen. Didn't you know that uh, Job is mentioned in line with uh, Noah, if my memory serves me right, at Ezekiel? There's a reason for that. Job is mentioned in the same line with Noah. Why? Because uh, they both followed everything that the Lord instructed them to do. So then, how do you, how will God say that about Gene Kim, I wonder? Oh, Gene Kim, nah, he's not going to quit the ministry. Oh, I know he's not going to mess up and sin. Oh, I know he's going to take care of that church very well in the Bay Area. I trust him above other people to take care of this place. I know him. He's going to do a good job. Man, I wish God could say that about me. Now, picture yourself. Can God say that about you? So, how can we do this? So, I'll tell you how you can do this when we look through the scriptures. Let's look at James chapter 2, verse 22. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. So, notice here, this matches with Genesis chapter 6, that... What God wants is everyone doing what His Word requires them to do. So, keep your hand here, because I have to go back here. Go to Romans 10, Romans 10. But you can't do it, what God tells you to do, unless you hear first. You know what the problem with people is? Oh yeah, I'm going to do this for the Lord, I'm going to do that for the Lord. But their problem is that they don't pay attention. Did you hear what I just said? This is extremely important. I see this as a problem with Christians quite often. The reason why they disobey the commandment of the Lord, even though they think they're following the word of the Lord, is because they don't listen first. They do first. That's a problem. You don't do first, then you're just going by how your flesh feels, what your flesh thinks, how you perceive things. You got to listen first. That is the problem with uh, mainstream Christianity today is that they do not listen. You need to listen first because how can you do the word if you don't even hear it? You got to hear. So first is listening. Look at Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the what? Word of God. See, you got to hear the Word of God in order to do. That's why James uh, 1 mentioned about doing the Word, not hears only. Because it takes for granted you're going to do the Word if you hear first. So, you have to hear the Word first. But it doesn't stop there. The second thing is faith. you got to believe. When you hear the Word... You have to believe that, Lord, even though I don't know, and I'll be honest, I am scared, and the questions come up in my mind, but I choose to believe. Amen. And I know that you're going to make everything all right. And I know that you've proven yourself true to me a billion times, so why doubt you now? So you have to fight against the skepticism, the doubts. So you have to believe. You might say, where is that? <laughs> you didn't read verse 17. Hearing by the word of God, but what comes after the hearing? The first part of verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing. Yeah. Yeah. See, it's the word of God first, then you hear it. Then you believe in it. 
That's why you don't follow God's command. You know why? You get offended. That's your problem. You disagree. You spite. How many? I've seen that all the time in church. All the time. I mean, I pastored for over 10 years. Don't tell me that I haven't had people who strongly disagreed or walked out or got upset or got offended. I have that plenty of times. Why? That's why they won't be able to live for the Lord, even though they think they're living right for the Lord. See, they don't believe. Uh, now I'll go back to James 1. Now you can do James 1. You thought you were doing the word, didn't you? But you didn't even do it. You didn't even do the first step. So you know what your problem is? I'll tell you what your problem is. You're hearing right now. And you're believing right now. Amen, amen. But guess what? After altar call, you repent and get right. You don't even do it. Come on. That's why you fail to follow the commandments of the Lord. That's your problem. You have to start doing it. You have to put commitment to action. When you go on the altar, it's not just sorry. It's also, I'm going to change, Lord. Do it. Now, it's obvious that we're weak in the flesh and the devil will tempt you. No, I know you're going to mess up. And you know that too. You know those are just words and you don't mean it. That's why you have to fight against that. And say, no, I commit it. I'm going to do it. Lord, uh, that's how my flesh feels and I'm not going to do it. I know so and that's how I feel. So will you help me, Lord? And you don't think God ain't going to help you? See, so you have to do it. Verse 22, 23, now you can read that again. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Why? Deceiving your own self. You tricked yourself. Yeah. You tricked yourself that you're right with the Lord. Why? Because you're a Bible believer. You're attending a Bible-believing church. Look, I don't care if you attend my church Come on, and you believe all the right doctrines and you say amen and you go on the altar all the time. You could just be as backslidden as a lost sinner and as fruitless and less works at, and try to please their Lord in the wrong way just like a lost sinner. Why? Because you tricked yourself. Why? You're not doing the word. That's the thing. It's not just hearing and believing. It's doing. Otherwise, you're tricking yourself that entire time. All right, that's how you can keep all the commandments of the Lord. All right? All right, go back to Genesis. Go back to Genesis. Go back to Genesis chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7 and verse 1. Genesis chapter 7. And we'll read verse 1. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Noah, so now the Lord is speaking to Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. So God's telling Noah, Hey, come on inside. You and all your household. That's the idea about house. He's talking about his household. That's the old English word for it. Into the ark. Come inside the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Because of Noah, God says, I've seen you righteous before me in my eyes. Amongst this wicked generation, I see you as the one that's righteous. So notice that we can see a beautiful type of salvation here. And a beautiful type of salvation, uh, I forgot to write this part. So the context of human survival, right? So I'll write that one, sorry. But anyways, with Noah's Ark... Uh, we see this as a beautiful type of salvation. It's a beautiful type of salvation. Why? They are saved from the flood. And by the way, this is almost even doctrinal because if Noah didn't go inside the ark, he would have drowned out with the lost world and went to hell, right? So that is his salvation. Salvation, God invites uh, not just one, you notice. God invites all. So that's the type of God you serve is that the Lord, he's not just content with you getting saved. He wants all your loved ones to go to heaven. That's, good, Amen. that's how yeah. he sees it as. That's why we do soul winning. What is soul winning? Yeah. It doesn't stop with a few souls and you go by Calvinist election, you're done. You have a select few. No, Boy. God says Boy. we need to get every single person out there. Everyone. Everybody has a chance to get saved. Yeah. Notice uh, Acts chapter 16, Acts 16. Acts 16. Now, this is a great verse that will encourage you. For some of you who might say that, you know, my mom and dad don't listen to me. Uh, my family member, my son or daughter, is not going to get saved. My wife, my husband, will never get saved. Never say never. 
Because the Bible shows that God's intention is not just to save you. He has every intention to make sure that your whole house gets saved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, it is good, now it is true that everybody has a free choice and God won't override it. So if a person sincerely wants to reject Jesus Christ, then God's going to let them go. But God's going to do whatever in His power where he's going to try to make sure your household gets saved if that's what you desire. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. If that's what you desire. Look at Acts chapter 16, verse 31. Yep. You notice what Paul and Silas told this soldier. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. So he says, so they say to this, centur uh, this soldier, this jailer, that you believe on Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Amen. But it does not leave off the last part. It says, and thy house. You know what God invites when God says, hey, I want you to get saved, come down on the altar. When you come down on the altar, you think that you're done and you say, praise the Lord, I got saved. God's like, no, 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 I'm not done yet. Why don't you invite your mother and father down here too? All right, get them too. So when God invites you to get saved, remember this, he's not only looking at you, he's looking at your mom, that's your good. dad, you. your brother, Lord, your sister, you, your son and daughter. Yeah. Good, yeah. He invites them to come the and get saved. Notice that it's free. It's not Calvinist selection. It's free. Look at Revelation. Look at the book of Revelation chapter 22. Thank you, Lord. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 17. Revelation chapter 22 verse 17. God wants, wants everyone to partake in that water of life. Freely. Everyone has the freedom to do so. God's not going to say a select few or my Calvinist election. No, He wants all. So he, there is freedom. There is free will. Verse 17. and this, uh, Revelation twenty two seventeen. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come. See that just like God told Noah, come and don't forget your whole house. And whosoever will. See that? That's anybody. Yeah. That's anybody. God's not picking and choosing. Whosoever, uh, notice at verse 17, and whosoever will. See that? Will. They can put their will into it. Let him take the water of life freely. They have a free choice. All right, let's go back. Let's go back. Let's go back to Genesis. Chapter 7. We'll look at verse 2. Genesis uh, chapter 7. And we'll read verse 2. Alright, here's a little deep doctrine now. Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens. Okay, so God says now every animal that is clean, you're going to take, uh, you're going to take it by sevens. Wait, wait a minute. Uh, we got a contradiction in scripture. Or so, as some of the critics say. Some critics will take this as proof that, oh, now we found a one contradiction in the Bible. And you're like, well, what contradiction are you talking about? But they're comparing Genesis 6 and 7. They're saying the contradiction between Genesis 6 and Genesis 7 is God originally said animals by two. But now God, all of a sudden, he said by seven. So there's a contradiction. No, you just don't read your Bible. Now, I'm not just saying that to be sarcastic. I'm being plainly serious. I'm being actually serious. They are literally not reading the Bible. Now, you might say, what are you talking about? Well, just read, man. <laughs> read. All right? Don't just look at me a tree full of owls and get just offended and upset and think that, you know, that I'm just being too mean and saying stuff that I don't mean to say. No, I mean what I say, man. <laughs> they don't read, all right? Problem with this day and age is that they don't hear the word of God. You got a bunch of problems right here. They don't pay attention. Okay, it's two. You're right. And then he said sevens. It's right. But they weren't paying attention. There are two things here. One, it's clean. That's the context here. The animals are referring to... Let me go over here. The animals are referring... To clean animals. The two is referring to unclean animal. And there is such a thing as clean and unclean. You never read that at the book of Leviticus? At the book of Leviticus, the Bible says that you're going to have to have uh, unclean as well as clean animals. That is found at the book of Leviticus and he gives a full list of uh, clean versus uh, unclean animals. 
But there's another uh, reason. If you look at the verse, it says by sevens. Did you notice that? He didn't say by seven. He said by sevens. So there's going to be sevens of what? Two. Keep reading. Verse 2, of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and a beast that are not clean by two. Oh, see that? The Bible already told you. So beasts that are unclean, that are not clean, you get, you're going to get two. And notice verse 2, by sevens, right? It puts S over there after seven. It doesn't say just seven, it says sevens. Why? The male and his female. See, a male and female, sevens of them. So guess what? There's a pair, but there's going to be seven pairs. That's the idea of clean animal. There's your answer right there. Yeah. God said, there's your two right there. And then uh, God says, that's your answer. They just don't read. The verse 2 would have given you the answer, but they didn't read. Verse 3, of fowls also of the air by sevens. So the birds as well, they're going to be by sevens. The male and the female, so obviously uh, a pair right there. So one's male, the other's female. To keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. To make sure that their seed, okay, their generations, their offspring, is going to be preserved throughout the face of the earth. So verse 3 is proof what God is looking at about your kind. See that? It's enough to survive. That's what God is looking at. Just enough where you can, the animal kingdom would be able to survive. Now, uh, actually, I didn't, because I thought I was, uh, I actually messed up. I forgot the chapter. Do people know the chapter in Leviticus about clean and unclean animal? I have some people here who know the scriptures, so I'm pretty confident that they could find that for me later on. So if you can find it for me, just uh, call it out, okay? But I'm going to uh, keep teaching. So God says that's uh, the distinction. There are unclean animals. And it's just going to be two, male and female. Then there's going to be clean animals. It's going to be pair, male and female, but we're going to have sevens of them. So that's what God did. If you look at verse 4, For yet seven days, so God says, Within seven days, I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights. So God says that within seven days after I give you the command, I'm going to make sure that rain's going to fall on the earth. And the rain, it's going to pour about 40 days and 40 nights. Now notice that there is a seven, and then there is a 40 after that. All right. Uh, is it Leviticus, sorry, 11? Did I hear? Yeah, 11, yeah. Uh, Leviticus 11 then, all right? Yeah. Leviticus 11. Yes, that's it. Thank you. Leviticus chapter 11. All right. Now, when we look at Leviticus chapter 11, notice that it gives a category between unclean and clean. And then I'm also going to show you a little deep doctrine here soon. If you look at Leviticus chapter 11, verse 3, whatsoever parteth the hoof and is cloven fooded and cheweth the cud among the beasts, that shall he eat. So they can eat these parts of animals that is cloven fooded. Or chew the cud. But at verse 4, Nevertheless, these shall ye not eat of them that chew the cud, or of them that divide the hoof. As the camel, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. So the camel is considered unclean. Notice verse 5, And the coney, because he cheweth the cud, and divideth not the hoof, but he is unclean unto you. And the hare. So you notice all your bunnies that... Uh, you can't eat them. I'm sure a lot of women are happy about that, you know. So, those cute little bunnies, God says, no, 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 don't eat them, all right. Today, you can eat, you can grab whatever animal, uh, any bunny you want. Verse 7, 2, yeah, verse 7 is the swine, the pig. Yeah. 47, 47, verse 47. Verse 47, all right, so let's look at verse 47 here. Verse 47. So, that's very plain, right? Very plain. To make a difference between what? The unclean and the clean. And between the beasts that may be eaten and the beasts that may not be eaten. So God realizes that there are unclean and clean animals. Now I want you to notice something pretty interesting right here. Uh, keep your hand at Leviticus 11. We're going to look at verse 9. But I want you to look at Genesis 6. Genesis 6. Uh, 
6. Look at the category here. Now we're going to hit some deep doctrine. Did you notice uh, why Noah was able to fit all the animals inside the ark? Is because he didn't have an aquarium. <laughs> all right? That's where you get a lot of your animals anyway. Is that, uh, notice he didn't have any classification of fish inside the ark. Or those that can survive in the water. You notice that verse chapter 6. And then you look verse 18 through 20. Fish is not mentioned there. You look at verse 2 and verse 3 of chapter 7, which we're reading. Verse 2 and verse 3 of chapter 7 that we're reading. Notice that uh, fish is not mentioned there. Okay, so fish is not mentioned. That's why you can fit all the animals inside the ark. But here's something interesting. Then, if God is trying to concentrate on the clean versus the unclean here, it makes me wonder this, okay? Okay. Here's one of the things you have to wonder, is that when God says a clean animal goes inside the ark, sometimes we ask ourselves this, are these the animals then that are considered clean, untainted by the demonic offspring? Because remember the demonic offspring that time, they were mingling with everything, right? Now I've shown you proof text, I'm not going to do that here, okay? So the point is, is that if the demonic offspring they were mingling with all sorts of animals and not just humans. These, clean cr these creatures were considered to be clean by God at chapter 7 and verse 2. But what about the fish? Would they be considered clean or unclean? Look back at Leviticus 11. Leviticus 11. Look at verse 9. Let's see what God thinks to be clean, but what not to be clean. I like the wording here. The wording is uh, interesting. Verse 9 of chapter Leviticus 11. These shall ye eat of all that are in the waters. So these are the things they can eat in the waters. Whatsoever hath fins and scales in the waters, in the seas and in the rivers, them shall ye eat. So God's saying those that have fins and scales, you can eat them. Verse 10. And all that have not fins and scales in the seas and the rivers of all that move in the waters... And of any living thing which is in the waters. Did you notice that wording? Mm -hmm. Any living thing in the water. That's not fish and scales. Why? Because it's not a product of my creation. It's something else. Mm -hmm. They shall be an abomination to you. God says they're going to be considered abomination. Wow. But uh, if we're going to be very honest, if you keep reading verse 11 and 12, 13... Obviously, uh, there are, what God is looking at is unclean animals. So then like uh, shellfish and then crab, lobster. Oh, man, to be a Jew during the Levitical law is very, very difficult. You know, <laughs> I just love lobster tail. So that's what God is looking at. But I also wonder if God is also looking that one of the reasons it's uh, yes, because they're considered unclean animals, but also because those sons of God were intermingling with so many sea creatures that you gotta, uh, it's good that you leave a lot of them alone too. You've got to be careful what you eat. So I wonder if that's the case. Because God says abomination at verse 10, any living thing which is in the waters that has not fish and scales. Well, if those sons of God were intermingling uh, those with fish and scales or any other living thing in the creatures, they're not, a, they're not that category of creature that God says, well, they're a fish or they're the one with fin and scales. No, God sees that as an abomination. That's a strange looking creature. That's a strange looking creature. Another thing to think about is this. Another thing to think about concerning about uh, the demonic offspring and Satan's class of creature is that he's not completely fish. That's not his class of creature. Remember his class of creature? He's an aquatic reptilian. He's an aquatic reptile. He's a water reptile. That's why he is known as what the Bible says, the dragon that is in the sea. The dragon that is in the sea. And... Uh, I've already shown you so many verses on that, so I'm not going to do that again. But if you look at the book of uh, Isaiah, for example, and then you look at uh, the book of Job, the Bible talks about Leviathan 
And this Leviathan, this uh, dreadful creature, is considered to be an aquatic reptilian. He's a snake that's in the water. That's something that the Lord says, you better watch out for that. That's, those are his class of creatures. All right, let's go back to Genesis. Let's go back to Genesis. Let's go back to Genesis. Chapter 7. And then we'll look at verse 4. We'll look at verse 4. And then we'll close it off right here. All right. Uh, the Bible says, For yet seven days, God says, Within seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth. So he's going to send the rain. So God's going to, uh, after he gave that command to Noah, he says, within seven days, I'm going to let it rain. And how long is the rain? Forty days and forty nights. So it's going to be forty days and forty nights he's going to rain all over the earth. And every living thing, uh, substance that I have made, so everything that God made that's alive, will I destroy from off the face of the earth. He's going to make sure that they're destroyed, wipe off the face of the earth. Now, notice the interest, uh, God, he has a strange way of doing things. He could have just sent the flood immediately. He could have waited a hundred days. Why did he say seven days, I'm going to wait. And then after that, I'm going to make sure it rains 40 days and 40 nights. Because our God is a God of numbers. And that's no stranger to Bible believers who are, who are already familiar with that. Our God being a God of numbers, we know... Now, God has uh, something specific with every number. Within every number, there are several importances. And that is, uh, notice one number here is seven, right? So one number here is seven. And then the second number is 40. Now, for some of you who don't know, I'm going to say this, but I'm going to take it for granted that you know what the number is. So I'm not going to spend time on it. But seven is referring to God's number. Forty is referring to trial and temptation. Seven is God's number because at Genesis chapter 2, the Bible says the Lord, uh, the Lord took seven seriously, the seventh day. You'll notice a lot of times God will give instruction on sevens. That's com uh, where it has completeness. It's perfection. That's seven. Seven days, that's how God completed everything. Uh, with Noah's uh, flood, God says, uh, God says seven days, that's it. It's completed, time's up. Forty is referring to trial, temptation, tribulation, because why? The Jews went around the wilderness uh, 40 years. Why? That was their trial, their temp because they tempted the Lord each year for each temptation. Jesus Christ went through temptation by the devil for 40 days in the wilderness. And uh, Noah and his family were going through that trial during uh, 40 days of rape. So that's why 40 follows along that. But the in, that's not the interesting part. All right? The interesting part in this verse is that within your Bible, for some weird reasons, uh, what you're going to notice is that when the Lord sometimes mentions 7, it follows 40. And, whenever, and sometimes when he mentions 40, there's a 7 that precedes it. Now, I don't know why, but there's a reason why 7 would precede 40 for some weird reason. And God would have that kind of system. So you'll see that sometimes in the Bible. Here are several passages that uh, you can look up and study for yourself. It's Numbers chapter 13, verse 22 through 25. The first one is Numbers 13, verse 22 through 25. The second one is 2 Kings chapter 12. 2 Kings chapter 12 and verse 1. And then chapter 8, verse 3, chapter 8, verse 3, and then verse 9. And then another example with Judges chapter 5, verse 31. Judges chapter 5, verse 31. And Judges chapter 6, verse 1. Judges chapter 6, verse 1. I don't know the answer to that, but uh, it would make a good study. All right? All right, ask Brother Sean after Bible study's over. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that today's teaching was a blessing to the hearers and uh, increased our knowledge of the Scripture, every word, made us understand uh, how your word is to be interpreted and that we grew more in doctrine. Dismiss us now with your blessing. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.